what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmade to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. So it's my pleasure again to introduce to Father Justin Gable. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming out on a Saturday. I really appreciate uh, you being here. And I hope, um, as I said to a couple of you, my, my, really, my ambition here is to really make it worth your while to have come all this way and to have given up your, your Saturday morning, which I know is precious. So I'll, hopefully I will be able to uh, do that justice. Uh, let's see here. So uh, let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Sweetest Jesus, body and blood most holy, be the delight and pleasure of my soul, my strength and salvation in all temptations, my joy and peace in every trial, my light and guide in every word and deed, and my final protection in death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So welcome. Um, again, this is a series of talks that is meant to be, if not uh, incredibly entertaining, uh, at least reasonably engaging as an introduction to the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, and with a twist. The twist is that I will be, as I am introducing uh, St. Thomas, uh, I will also try to show some of the contemporary questions and debates I think his thought is immediately relevant to. Thus, I hope to keep St. Thomas uh, fresh for those of you who already know him a little, or a lot, uh, while at the same time showing how he is still important and essential for our contemporary world. Uh, first, I should say something about the talk, uh, the title of this particular talk, uh, the brain in a vat is a thought experiment which many of you may have already heard about. Um, it is commonly used to illustrate global skepticism. So you are, imagine that you are told uh, that at this very moment you are actually a brain hooked up to a sophisticated computer program that can perfectly simulate experiences of the outside world by sending various electronic stimuli to appropriate parts of your brain. We need hardly say that such a computer or computer program doesn't actually exist. The skeptical import of the brain in the, the that argument or scenario is that given the fact that it seems like a perfectly possible situation, we cannot rule it out in principle and in fact movies like The Matrix seem to give it some kind of visual and cinematic uh, plausibility. It is therefore uh, possible that all our perceptions, beliefs, and knowledge about the external world are in fact false. Uh, we never like that possibility too very much, uh, and most philosophers are bothered about, uh, by it enough to try to at least refute it in idea. Uh, the brain in the vat is, by the way, um, a contemporary updated version of Descartes' evil deceiver argument. Descartes asks about the reliability of our beliefs. Uh, he's really interested in trying to give us a kind of certain and indubitable foundation for human knowledge. And he asks things like, do our beliefs about the external world in general provide a firm and indubitable foundation for knowledge or don't they? Are they doubtful in any way? And then Descartes proceeds to point out the many ways in which we can make mistakes about the external world. He discusses various ways in which we can be led astray by our senses, including hallucinations or mirages or simple errors in judgment. 
Uh, and then he gives us a more global situation, uh, consideration or situation. He says, even if we could uh, rely on our senses in particular cases, what if we are being systematically deceived? There might, for instance, he says, be some kind of evil demon that makes us consistently draw false conclusions about reality, and so our beliefs and perceptions about the world are not foolproof. In fact, they're not just wrong sometimes, they're consistently, systematically wrong. And as most of you know, the conclusion to all this is Descartes will look for something else, namely the proposition, I think, therefore I am, as the sure and certain foundation for all scientific knowing. Now we could, as many philosophers have done, focus on skepticism and trying to refute it. Indeed, there have already been a number of attempts to refute the skeptical conclusions, not only of Descartes' own scenario, Descartes himself was the first to do so, appealing to the idea of God, but then we could actually try to refute the brain and the vet argument in particular, and there have been a few philosophers who have tried to do this. The gentleman on the left, his name is Hilary Putnam, and uh, he's uh, relatively recently deceased, but he's one example of a philosophy, philosopher who spent a good deal of time trying to uh, provide a refutation for the brain and the vet scenario, and he relies on the resources of analytic philosophy and modern logic. His approach is certainly uh, challenging and I would say probably less than successful because even those who are sympathetic to him and want him to be right don't necessarily even really understand the argument all that well and therefore are uncertain whether he ends up actually being successful in, in refuting the brain and the vat scenario. I am not going to try to delve into these depths. Uh, first of all, because I would give you about five or 10 minutes before your eyes slowly roll back, <laughs> you start to relax in your seat, <laughs> and you are lost, uh, if not to me, at least to the conscious world. Uh, we're not gonna do that. I don't propose to wade into those waters this morning, but to suggest that there is a certain picture of the human person, a picture that tends to see a part of us, the brain, if we are materialists, um, uh, and the soul, if we are dualists or spiritualists, as more real than the rest of us. So, um, a couple of illustrations of uh, how important the brain is to our personalities and characters. Um, and this is really to already have been misled by a very questionable and a very problematic idea or picture of what it means to be a human being. We have ceased to see the unity and integrity of the human person and the importance of the body, the emotions, and the senses. And it is to heal this modern illness, this philosophically unhealthy condition, that I think Aquinas can serve as our physician, providing us a philosophical therapy, if you will, that will make uh, these presuppositions uh, behind the brain in the vat less compelling to us. He will undermine them and therefore refute the idea behind the scenario in a way that's perhaps more intelligible and maybe even more effective than a direct refutation along the lines of Hilary Putnam. It is, um, as you probably already know, an old tradition to identify ourselves by a single part of ourselves. Strongly spiritualist religious sects from very early in the history of humanity uh, embraced things like reincarnation and the transmigration of souls, and therefore identified us with a certain part of us, the soul, that could detach from the rest of us. And even Plato, at least um, if we take some of his dialogues seriously, considered the soul as something separable from the body, more akin to a pilot in a ship than something integrally and intrinsically connected to a body. In many, day, in many ways, the idea that we are simply our brains is the philosophical progeny of some of these attitudes towards ourselves, if only in an updated materialist kind of way. So the brain in the vat, we could say, is an updated materialist version of dualistic thinking, uh, which would probably surprise a lot of materialists who have come to think of themselves as radically opposed to dualism they will be surprised by this, but I think it's true nevertheless. We'll return to this a little bit later. So let us turn to our philosophical therapy. Allow Aquinas to 
uh, lay us back on the couch and start to ask us Freudian questions. I love Ella Fitzgerald, and one of the songs I love most is Body and Soul. Are human beings material creatures or immaterial? This is the kind of trick question that I love to throw out at my students, and they usually are savvy enough to look past it and see that I'm trying to trick them, and the answer is, in fact, both. Uh, and that's certainly what Aquinas argues. We are both, both body and soul. Against those who would see the body as something added on to what is really real about us, our mind and our soul, or however we wanted to picture that, Aquinas affirms that to be a body is part of being human. Aquinas would disagree with anyone who would describe our relation with our bodies as anything but essential for being human. It simply makes no sense to talk about human beings that don't have bodies. But we are not merely physical beings either. Like other living things, we transcend what is purely material. And here we might think of inanimate objects, purely physical things like rocks, chemicals, or elements in the periodic table. We do this by engaging in activities, and plants and animals do this too, like growing, sensing, and moving. And as it turns out, we also transcend the material world in an even more radical way through our intellectual activity, that power by which we come to understand the world around us. Now, form is that which gives something its essential structure in Aristotelian and Thomistic metaphysics. It's what makes something to be what it is. Matter is what is structured by form, the stuff that receives organization and definite characteristics by form. We can understand this on the analogy of the statue, and this is an analogy that both Aristotle and Aquinas use. The form of the statue is its shape. The matter is what, it sh is what is shaped. So when we talk about a statue, we really refer primarily to the form of the statue. What is the statue of? It's the statue of David, or it is, it is uh, Rodin's thinker. The matter that is shaped is the bronze, or the iron, or the, uh, the stone. Uh, this analogy is a, a bit limited, and both Aristotle and Aquinas admit this, because in reality, even uh, some kind of definite material that exists in nature is already a form matter composite. For instance, bronze or stone already has uh, characteristics and structure that flow from its atomic or molecular structure, which is a kind of, even if very simple kind of form on the atomic or molecular level. And uh, when it comes to artifacts in general, statues or chairs or beds, um, the form and the matter have a kind of contingent relationship. That is, the form has been uh, taken from outside um, it is uh, basically an idea or a, uh, a model in the mind of the craftsman, and it is imposed in an extrinsic way on the, f on the matter. And so the uh, integral or intricate or intrinsic relationship between form and matter that exists in purely natural things like um, plants, animals, and all living things isn't quite captured by the statue analogy. And yet, it's a very helpful tool to help us grasp what Aristotle and Aquinas were actually getting at, is that form and matter work together to give something its, o its own peculiar integrity and character. Matter by itself is actually nothing, or we might say more accurately, nothing yet, which is why Aristotle and Aquinas do refer to prime matter but it is more a limit idea of matter without any form, and they refer to it as mere potency. And as mere potency, it doesn't actually exist as such. So to uh, maybe belabor the obvious, you will never walk around uh, Berkeley and bump into prime matter. Prime matter is not an actual thing that you will ever uh, encounter. Prime matter is something that is always already combined with form. Insofar as something actually is, it must have a kind of structure. We'll never encounter something that actually exists that doesn't have a kind of what character to it, and that what character is given by its form. So even if it's some strange goo at the back of the refrigerator, and you don't know exactly what it is, you know it's not just you know, like prime matter back there, it's, 
It's got an origin and actual structure, and you could potentially, if you wanted to, which you don't, uh, put it under a microscope and find out what it actually is, which would probably just be even more horrifying. <laughs> so prime matter can't actually be anything because to be anything means to be something in particular, and to be something in particular means to have this kind of form or structure. Four makes a thing the kind of thing it is. To be water, H2O, means having a certain molecular structure. Two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. To be a cat means having a certain arrangement of organs and body parts, which are themselves structured by various tissues and cell networks, themselves composed of cells and organelles, which are ultimately composed of molecules. And now we go from one level to another to another, from the unified organism all the way down to its atomic and subatomic structures, which underlie all material things. At each level, we find uh, we have certain parts, which we might call matter, which are given a kind of unified structure, which we call form. Aquinas, following Aristotle, distinguishes between accidental and substantial forms. Accidental forms are those which we can take on or lose without changing what we are. So for instance, I can go to the beach, this is entirely hypothetical, uh, and get a good tan, again, entirely hypothetical. Uh, I've taken on an additional accidental form, but this hasn't changed the fact that I'm a human being and I'm still, for better or for worse, Father Justin. Substantial forms, by contrast, are essential to who and what we are. If we lose them, we cease to be, or we cease to be the kind of thing and become we are and become something altogether different. Um, so for instance, if we lose our soul, we're going to ultimately no longer be human. We will be, uh, not to be too macabre, um, a corpse. And we will eventually become, um, we could say, different elements and molecular compounds rather than a unified human being. Unlike a few of his contemporaries, Aquinas believed that since we have a certain unity, all things have a unity insofar as they are beings, we have only one substantial form. Substantial forms are not only uh, the source of what um, and who we are, but are also the source of our dynamic properties. In fact, we can't really disentangle the two. So being, the hu being human is the reason why we can do human things like think about our existence, fall in love, um, imagine a more just world, not to mention activities like running, jumping, and playing, which other animals, of course, do too, but we do in our own unique human way. Aquinas, following Aristotle, much of the tradition takes the soul as the principle of life. Anything that is living has a soul, plants and animals as well as human beings. So this idea, the Greek conception of the human soul is a little bit different from what we might uh, get in later Christian tradition insofar as it's, uh, it's a little bit simpler, more straightforward. It simply happens to be that which differentiates living things from uh, inanimate things. So what's the difference between a plant or an animal and um, a rock or a bunch of chemicals, the difference is, uh, in classical thinking, the presence of a soul. Living things are the, those which move or operate on their own, and the soul is what differentiates them from those beings which are nothing but material. And so the soul is what allows living things to engage in activities like movement and reproduction, growth, sensation, um, and the like. Living things transcend being pure matter by having souls. In other words, souls are the forms of living things. All things from the lowliest separated electron to the largest blue whale have forms, but there is something qualitatively different between the living and the non-living, the organic and the inorganic, the animate and the inanimate. The difference is the type of form and that difference is encapsulated in the word soul. And though Aquinas and Aristotle don't have modern biology at their fingertips and so aren't scientifically precise about many things, they are astute enough to notice that living beings are organic wholes composed of differentiated 
well-articulated parts, whereas inanimate things are not so composed, but are for the most part entirely uniform or are essentially heaps of particular elements or chemicals. So this is the difference between, again, you or a cat versus a simple rock. This particular rock might be granite or um, might have a few different elements rolling around in it, but it's a relatively simple and straightforward uniform structure. Whereas you are pretty darn complex, right? You have not only skin and flesh and bone um, and blood, but you also have all these wonderful organs that are really quite unique, right? Liver, pancreas, um, lung, heart, in addition to five fingers, five toes, eyeballs, and eardrums. So we have this well-articulated structure, and this again highlights the difference between living things which have souls and inanimate things which do not. Now notice so far, even this kind of basic characterization of life and the difference between living and non-living, which is encapsulated in the idea of soul, how different the soul is in this conceptuality from the idea of a soul as a kind of ghost in the machine, which was actually a phrase penned by Gilbert Ryle in uh, the mid 20th century. Notice too that something is either alive or it is not. There, there, though there might be some cases that are hard to categorize accurately, so for instance, there are some organisms that are so simple, it's hard sometimes to distinguish between them and the inorganic. We might think of bacteria or viruses in particular. And there are also some inorganic elements, crystals for instance, which have chemical properties that seem to resemble uh, growth and so make us wonder if they're not alive in some sense. So there are some of these tricky cases. So sometimes it's hard for us to categorize, but what we do know is they either fall on one side or another. Things can't be alive and not. So unfortunately, no walking undead here. Uh, zombies are a contradiction from the uh, <laughs> Aristotelian Thomistic standpoint. Um, souls, human or otherwise, are therefore not ethereal entities either that could exist independently of the body. So. Um, Again, Poltergeist might be one of your favorite movies, but uh, it's not supported by Aristotelian and Thomistic philosophy. Uh, in fact, as the principle that makes living things to be what they are and um, are therefore always the form of a particular kind of body, organic in its substance, souls are accurately described as the substantial forms of living bodies they are an embodied phenomena, not a disembodied phenomena. That the soul is the form of a body has some very important implications. First, it means that our souls are made for the bodies they inform. And they don't go beyond this except in one very special instance, uh, which we'll talk about in just a little while. Souls are not something in themselves, but exist in order to structure matter so as to make a particular kind of living thing. Secondly, this means that living bodies cease to be alive when they no longer possess a soul. Again, I become dead or a corpse if I lose my soul, if my soul is separated from my body. I will revert essentially to inanimate matter. Aquinas will make a distinction between the essence of the soul, the powers of the soul, and the activities of the soul. Aquinas distinguishes the various powers of the soul, various capacities for action from the soul itself. He says, quote, all the powers of the soul flow from the essence of the soul as from their principle, but they are not to be confused with that essence itself. So though there are multiple powers of the soul, there is but one soul. Since we are one, the soul that makes us to be who and what we are must also be one. But that soul has multiple powers, nutrition, growth, reproduction, sensation, uh, movement, and in our case as human beings, understanding. More basic forms of life partake of the first three that I, listen, that I listed, um, particularly uh, growth and uh, nutrition and reproduction. Um, animals partake of sensation and movement on top of these, 
and we as human beings partake of all of that plus reason, um, which is considered to be a very special trait of human beings, which is one of the reasons why we're defined as rational animals. Now, notice here that there is a hierarchy, not just a diversity. Animal souls can do everything that plant souls can do, and human souls can do everything that animal souls and plant souls can do. Um, human beings have all the powers of all the other souls plus that additional power of rationality. So this is the origin of the hierarchy of being in Thomistic and Aristotelian philosophy, is that you have plant souls that can do this much, animal souls that can do that plus more, and then uh, human beings at the top, at least of the material spectrum, um, where we can do it all, plus we have this additional and mysterious power to understand the world around us. Since the powers of the soul flow from the essence of the soul, they indicate something of the soul's essence while being distinct from it. We know of the soul's powers in turn because those powers are exhibited in the activities of the thing, plant, animal, or human being. It is because animals are able to move around and sense. Um, they're able to go after sensory goods, right? They're hungry or they flee danger. Um, they do those things and that's how we know they're animals. We understand something as a plant rather than simply a rock because it can grow and nourish itself and reproduce through seeding the area around it. But because it does not move or sense its environment in a more active way, we don't tend to confuse it with an animal. So uh, we naturally reason from the activities of something to its powers to its, its essence. Or conversely, we could say the essences of things are discerned in their capacities for certain activities, which are in turn expressed in those activities themselves. Aquinas will talk about the five senses. We do have five exterior senses according to St. Thomas and you'll be shocked to hear that they're sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Um, pretty basic, right? Aquinas follows Aristotle in holding that sight is our highest sense. So he will actually talk about the unique um, level of information and uh, indeed pleasure that we get from simply seeing things. So if you ever wondered why people just can't seem to help themselves, but there is, got, con, no matter what, there is going to be spectator slowing whenever there's an accident. There is a good philosophical reason for that. And that's because there's a certain um, need, desire, and pleasure that is fulfilled by our simply being able to take things in and understand them on a visual level. Conversely, Aristotle and Aquinas will both agree that our most basic sense is actually touch. And the empirical evidence for this is, again, relatively straightforward, according to both of them. They look around and they see that there are plenty of kinds of things that have the sense of touch, but no other uh, real external senses. Whereas there are plenty, uh, everything that has more senses, everything that has sight and hearing and smell, also has touch. So touch appears to be the most basic sense of all. Um, and uh, toward the end of this lecture, I'm going to actually suggest that there might be good um, philosophical and neurological reasons for that. Um, sight is actually a lot more touch-like than we often appreciate. Now, uh, St. Thomas will actually posit five more senses, and here again, he's, he's following Aristotle fairly closely. Um, there is the common sense, imagination, fantasy, the, what's called the cogitative sense, and memory. And I'll talk about these real quickly uh, in, in each case. Um, so when we say five more senses, we're not talking about ESP, we're talking about ISP, internal sensory perception, not extrasensory perception. Um, so the, uh, the idea behind this is, um, again, should hopefully make quite a bit of sense to you. Our external senses are really, really important. They communicate uh, a manifold of things about the external world. But we need to coordinate them in order 
to have unified objects and a, a meaningful environment around us. All, otherwise, it would be just a kind of chaos. We would essentially have five different data streams coming in and no way to put them together in a way that actually gives us a coherent universe around us. We actually have a sense that does this. It's called the common sense or the census communis. Now for Aristotle and Aquinas, this doesn't refer to common sense in the ordinary way we use that phrase. So uh, when you hear common sense in a uh, quotation by uh, Aquinas or Aristotle, what they're not talking about is um, what's supposed to be uh, just kind of generally known and um, you know things like street smarts, which uh, as you probably have realized in your own life are a great deal less common than the phrase might uh, indicate. Um, so we coordinate information from our various senses, from sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell, uh, via the common sense. The common sense is what binds them all together, coordinates them, and can uh, distinguish the information that's coming from one versus the information that's coming from another. So for instance, if your um, your visual input and your um, audio input is not meshing together. It's your common sense that's telling you uh, Netflix is out of whack and <laughs> what you're seeing, the lips are moving but you don't hear anything and then you hear something but there are no lips moving. Um, you sense that there's a problem with Netflix via your common sense. That's, that's how that works. Uh, and again, without the common sense, we'd, uh, we basically have five different data streams that would have nothing to do with one another. We only receive sensible forms from our external senses, but we're able to retain them. That's really, really important. And we do that through um, the internal sense of imagination. Imagination is, in a way, what allows us to store uh, the images that we receive through our external senses. It's a kind of storehouse of images. Imagination also includes the ability to creatively recombine those images, whether visual or audio or tactile, to produce new images. So uh, one of uh, the philosopher, the contemporary philosopher Hume, one of his uh, favorite examples is Golden Mountain, right? You have an understanding of the element of gold, or you've seen um, a gold bar or gold bullion. You've also seen mountains. Now you can kind of take those images and mix them up and put them together and think of a golden mountain, right? Or you can think of um, Smog in The Hobbit guarding his big stash of gold inside the mountain. That's all uh, possible because of our faculty of imagination. Uh, Avicenna, the Islamic philosopher, will actually uh, parcel that out into a separate imaginative faculty which he calls fantasy. But for the most part, Aquinas makes it one and the same thing. We also have what is called a cogitative sense, the sensus cogitativa. And this is our ability to connect uh, universals and particulars in straightforward concrete experience. It is the human uh, analogate to what is called the estimative sense in animals. Uh, estimative like estimate. Now the estimative sense in animals is basically an animal's way of not only being able to take in basic sensory information, but also to relate it directly to its own practical well-being. And we see this in animals all the time. So for instance, you have a wolf on the edge of the forest and it's, it's on the verge of a pasture or meadow and not only sees these little bits of fluffy white but also sees um, essentially what it's going to perceive as yummy <laughs> or good. Um, now what it's not doing, let's be clear, is it's not seeing sheep as if it had a concept or a word for those little bits of white fluff. But it also doesn't just see white fluff. It sees this, those, those sheep out there, sheep in whatever way the wolf apprehends them, is immediately apprehended also as immediately relative to or relevant to its own personal well-being. So it's immediately going to want to uh, go after those and have a, a nice midday snack. The sheep in, the, in their turn are not going to see simply a streak of black running toward them. 
it's going to immediately, those sheep are going to immediately have a sense of bad danger, right? And those sheep are going to run away uh, unless they're really, really stupid, which does sometimes happen. Our census cogitativa is more, more sophisticated. Um, it's not simply a matter of practically relating the world to our well-being, although that happens too. It's our ability to associate this sensory information with other sensory information that we've gathered. So think of it as our uh, uh, associative capacity to see patterns and principles at work in the world. And it's this already uh, robust capacity for pattern and principle discernment that then we're able to take up and actually uh, use in a more fully uh, intellectual and reasoned fashion when we actually abstract concepts. So we're not to the level of reason or intellectual activity quite yet. We're still on the level of, of, of sensation and sensibility. But even at this level, human sensibility is already a great deal more than simply taking in uh, disparate a visual, audio, and um, we could even say like gastroenterological of information um, and putting those together. They also mean something to us. We already see connections. We're already form connect forming connections that will eventually become the basis for our concept formation. So the census cogitativa uh, allows us to see this particular thing in front of us as already standing in comparison with other things like it, or perhaps in contrast with things unlike it, so as to prepare us to potentially uh, connect this uh, to more generally, general characteristics and eventually fully robust universal concepts. This more robust apprehension of things and their interconnection and, and more general characters, including their reality as past events, are retained by our memory. So this is where memory comes in. Memory allows us to take these uh, experiences that we have in the, the fuller sense of the word and retain them. And human beings have uh, a power of memory that uh, most other living things don't seem to have. We can actually um, pull up at will. Um, we can deliberately try to access different memories. Someone says, where were you two and a half weeks ago? Um, P.S. Your answer will determine whether we think you're guilty of murder or not. All of a sudden, you're going to furiously think back, where was I, what was I doing? And, uh, and we're able to do that. It's actually a very sophisticated capacity that human beings have that pretty much no other, um, no other animal has. And that's part of this uh, internal um, sense that we have that falls under the heading of memory for Aquinas. So the internal senses form the basis of coherent experiences and a more sustained engagement in comprehension of the world that is preparatory for our understanding and reasoning in the full sense of that. It is only because we are um, not only able to sense things via our external senses, but coordinate those and retain the, that information via our internal senses that we have a fully robust apprehension of particular objects to experience. Oops, going too fast. Okay. Aquinas distinguishes uh, very clearly between sensation and understanding. And this is gonna be important when we talk about uh, the immortality of the soul. Sensation is always connected with the physical change in certain bodily organs light hitting our retinas, sound waves hitting our eardrums, and the like. But when we understand and reason, no physical change in any, any bodily organ is actually required. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Our mind is able to possess or grasp the form of something, a tree, a cat, a mountain, um, mathematical objects like triangles. Um, they're able to, we're able to grasp those in immaterial ways not physically or literally becoming that thing, but having it in mind immaterially. And it is only by being immaterial that the human mind can potentially know any kind of being in contrast to our sensing that being, which is always based on material organs. 
Now we know that material organs are material because first of all we can usually examine them in their materiality by dissecting an eye or examining uh, an ear or a tongue or the nerves in a fingertip for instance. And Aquinas' argument is going to be that their materiality always limits them to perceiving one kind of thing. Or more precisely we might, be, uh, we might say perceiving one kind of thing in a particular kind of way. So for instance, um, sight, we're only able to uh, latch on to things that are present before us and have some kind of visibility. They have color and, um, and there, there is enough light for us to be able to catch a glimpse of them. But when it comes to our knowing and our understanding, this can happen in many more ways and in ways that transcend and aren't limited to what is physically present before us. We can know many things at one time. We can know things that are absent. We can know things that are distant and we can even know things that no longer exist. And we can even know things that are strictly speaking uh, have never existed. So for instance, we can talk meaningfully about a unicorn uh, and its attributes even though unicorns are actually at bottom nothing more than uh, fantastical creatures. I hope that's not a spoiler for anybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> Again, our senses are always confined to what's right in front of us, right? And we, we walk away, we no longer are able to sense that thing. And if that thing is in our physical presence, we might be able to we connect with it through imagination, right? So if we've seen it in the past, we can bring that image back up. And we can certainly talk about understanding what kind of thing that is, but we can't sense it anymore. So sensation and understanding are quite distinct activities. And um, understanding is characterized, by, uh, according to St. Thomas and Aristotle, by its immateriality, by its being a spiritual apprehension of things. Now Aquinas believes that the ability to come to understand the world around us is an essential part of being human. He will do not deny that we often do so quite imperfectly, but our knowledge is genuine nevertheless. So to say that we don't know as well as we'd like to or that human knowledge is quite fallible uh, isn't going to actually derail Aquinas' position. In fact, he uh, will acknowledge that fairly frequently. For Aquinas, as for Aristotle, and many other philosophers, our knowledge begins with our bodily encounter with the world, and particularly through our senses. So we're not gonna know anything unless we actually have a sensible encounter with things around us. And it is because our senses are affected by objects in the world and furnish us with information about these objects in the form of images, or what Aristotle and Aquinas will call phantasms, that we come to a real knowledge of things. Now what knowledge does is it begins with those phantasms or those images and abstracts from the matter of what is sensed. So it, it abstracts from the individual characteristics and sees the universal meaning within those images or phantasms. It penetrates to an understanding of the essence of the thing rather than particular accidental characteristics. To give you an example, I have a dog, Fido or perhaps I have uh, several dogs, and having encountered a number of dogs, I start to understand something about what being a dog means in general. It means maybe chasing a squirrel around a tree. Um, it means uh, barking and um, being scared or uh, threatened or um, aggressive towards cats. It means gulping down your food. It means wagging your tail when you're happy. It means running around and falling into the pool. Um, all these are dog-like things. Um, from experiencing all these individual dogs, I begin to abstract by comparing uh, all the dogs that I have uh, come across, and they don't need to be an extensive collection. Um, but I can abstract the concept of dog. And uh, if this is, uh, how it normally goes, my abstraction will at first be quite imprecise. And perhaps it won't even have any real kind of verbal articulation. But as time and my experience with canines continues, and with more precision and maybe eventually with linguistically formulated um, help, 
um, I will actually come up with a, a, a real, a fairly precise definition for what constitutes a dog. And if I have this concept of dog, it will transcend Fido and Snickers and all the other kinds of dogs that I encounter, uh, since all these are simply individual instances of a dog. Likewise, my concept of dog is no longer simply an image because it applies to a variety of images of dogs, right? It can apply to golden retrievers and cocker spaniels and Labradors and so on. And then I can deepen this concept by scientific investigation. So veterinarians and um, uh, zoologists probably know a great deal more about dogs than I do. And the more precise my concept is, uh, the more information I have at my disposal. And then I can, I can reapply this concept of dog to any particular dog that crosses my path later on. So this is how we go from particulars to uh, universal concepts. And this process, um, which I've given you a, a kind of very simple and perhaps simplistic view of what that's this concept or this, this process entails, uh, the overall process is again called abstraction. Now abstraction is an achievement of the active intellect. While our minds do not simply construct a world and they do not arbitrarily inject meaning into it, we do have to do some work to make the world around us intelligible. We have to abstract concepts or what uh, Aristotle and Aquinas will call species from matter in order to uncover the form, the source of intelligibility existing in it. So uh, this is from the first part of the Summa Theologia, question 79, article three. Aquinas says, the natures or forms of sensible things which we understand are not actually intelligible. We must therefore assign on the part of the intellect some power to make things actually intelligible by abstraction of the species from material conditions. And such is the necessity of active intellect. Probably a more straightforward way of articulating this is we encounter particular things and particular things are instances of universal kinds. But we don't um, have direct access to those universal kinds. We have to see those universal kinds or concepts or species in those individual things. And that requires some amount of intellectual discernment on our part. So we only encounter essences and determinate natures in those particulars, and so we have to do a little bit of work distinguishing the essence from uh, any kind of individuating conditions or um, unique attributes that don't pertain to the essence as such. And this process is again what Aristotle and Aquinas call abstraction. It is sometimes identified as the first, first act of understanding and sometimes referred to as um, simple apprehension, which is a phrase I don't appreciate that much because in most cases it seems anything but simple. The abstraction of essences and their articulation as fully developed concepts can be uh, quite an uh, involved process. But it is always the work, according to St. Thomas, uh, of the active or agent intellect. But once we have done that work, we retain that concept habitually in our passive intellect, which is a kind of intellectual memory, and we're able to structure the world and understand it more deeply as, the, as a result. Okay, so now that we have some of the basics of Aquinas' understanding of, of human being in general, soul and form, um, uh, matter and body, and uh, agent uh, and passive intellect as well as uh, the internal external senses, uh, I think we have enough uh, in front of us, to, uh, of us to be able to see how Aquinas and Aristotle's understanding of being human actually could uh, make some kind of contribution to contemporary philosophy of mind. A central concern of philosophy of mind, and, some, and sometimes it seems like the only concern of contemporary philosophy of mind, is to try to get clear on the relationship between body and soul, the physical and the mental. Since the middle of the 20th century, philosophy of mind has included a number of different approaches to the questions of uh, how those two things are related. And just a couple things to note before we look at some of those approaches. 
First, uh, the various approaches that I'm going to describe to you are uh, almost without exception, exclusive alternatives. That is, you can only choose one. If you choose one, it tends to push out all the others. They tend to be incompatible. What is more, secondly, there has been very little consensus amongst philosophers of mind as to the success of any one approach. So it seems like you consistently have, and at any given moment, in the, uh, amongst philosophers of mind, uh, advocates for pretty much any or all of the approaches that I'm going to introduce to you this morning. And, so, and there doesn't seem to be any way of convincingly adjudicating so as to bring, you know, uh, advocates of one approach to the camp of another. There seems to be a little bit of a stalemate, although um, philosophers of mind in general have become more and more pessimistic about a number of approaches and have been looking for uh, solutions. So here are some of the approaches to philosophy of mind uh, that we could see uh, St. Thomas having something to say about. The first is substance dualism. Substance dualism has been around for quite uh, a long time. <laughs> we could say several millennia. Um, its most um, outstanding uh, and notorious advocate is Rene Descartes, pictured here. His dates are 1596 to 1650. And uh, arguably Plato himself, um, who uh, suggests in dialogue with the Phaedo, that the human soul is uh, a, a different kind of thing than the human body. It's not only separable from, but perhaps is better off without being attached to a body. Now, substance dualism is unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, um, not uh, by any means the most popular theory in the philosophy of mind at present. While it gives us a very good foundation for explaining the difference between physical and mental, and uh, encapsulating that difference uh, into uh, uh, radically different kinds of substance, right? Physical substance versus mental substance. It perhaps separates them a little too thoroughly. Uh, having two very different kinds of things leaves us, for instance, with the question of how they can possibly interact. The mental is completely immaterial, free from physical causality, and characterized by thinking. And material substance is virtually the opposite in every way. It is material, subject to causal laws, and we might say simply matter in motion. How do these two radically different kinds of things that have absolutely nothing in common end up having anything to do with one another? And this is a question that we could raise on a kind of universal or cosmological level, but it becomes particularly pressing when we start to think of human beings who are supposed to be both physical and mental. How do we relate the physical and mental in such a way as to not only allow them to interact, but also to interact at such a level that we end up having unified, integrated, real human beings walking around? How do body and soul, one physical, the other mental, come together not only to interact, but to form one unified person? These sorts of problems, from many perspectives, um, appear virtually insoluble, and so uh, this has led a number of philosophers to abandon um, substance dualism as uh, a viable alternative. We could say the kind of radical other end of the spectrum is physicalism. Physicalism does end up being uh, a pretty popular position in philosophy of mind, although strictly speaking, it is a family of positions. So what all these positions have in common, all these different flavors of physicalism have in common, is that ultimately in one way or another, everything that exists is physical. All properties and characteristics, whether, we ca whether in common parlance and whether we commonly think of them as mental or physical, are all at bottom physical. And, uh, and again, there are a couple of varieties and I want to talk about a couple. Um, the first is eliminative materialism, or what is sometimes referred to as eliminativism. Uh, doesn't roll off the tongue, and uh, that actually reflects uh, it as a theory. It doesn't roll off the mind either. Um, it's the radical claim that um, all our ordinary common sense understanding of mind is deeply wrong. 
and that some or all of the mental states posited by common sense do not actually exist. Um, folks like Daniel Dennett and Paul and Patricia Churchland are usually described as eliminative materialists. Many philosophers of mind have found this kind of materialism unappealing since it explains away rather than it actually explains our mental life and the experiential dimension of being human. It is a hard sell, to say the least, to make a convincing case that the mental is not simply reducible to the physical, but is actually an illusion and something that never really existed in the first place. And uh, eliminativism actually has very little to say as to exactly why we think that illusion um, in, up in the first place. Why do we think and attribute to ourselves mental lives that don't actually exist in any real way? Uh, the position tends towards incoherence, too, because uh, eliminativists always use things like words and ideas to convey their own intellectual position, which, again, shouldn't exist if we are, strictly speaking, being consistent. So it's a little bit of a problem. So there are other forms of physicalism that are more appealing to philosophers of mind. One of them is reductive physicalism, which basically says, although there are a whole bunch of different sciences out there, we can all reduce, we can reduce all of them to physics. Right? They're really, um, anything that talks about mental properties is really just shorthand for talking about physical properties and what we need to do is actually translate our mental verbiage back into physical verbiage in order to be truly accurate about what's actually out there. So if we are really precise in our concepts, we'd reduce them to concepts in the discipline of physics. Now exactly how this works is where uh, the difficulties arise. Because every time physicalism tries to get to the nitty gritty, that's when problems occur. Uh, for instance, brain plasticity becomes a little bit of a problem for physicalists. Because if you want to say that mental states are actually just physical states, what you want to say is how that happens. And if a particular mental state correlates exclusively with one physical state, that gives us a very straightforward solution. But so pretend that there is something, as there is, called brain plasticity, which means that if you have maybe some kind of um, brain defect or traumatic brain injury, your brain will actually rewire itself and physically will become something entirely different. As it happens, your mental experiences don't completely alter. You don't actually go from one universe to a completely different universe. So this causes problems for reductive physicalism that wants to say in some sense that mental states are nothing more than physical states. Well, we can't say that in any kind of straightforward or simple kind of way. We also want to keep open the door, for instance, that there are other kinds of organisms in the world that could potentially be intelligent that don't share any physical structures with us. Do we have nothing in common with them? Do they not experience the same world that we do? There seems to be what is uh, often referred to as a kind of chauvinism in physicalism, which basically says, in order to have what we call mental states, you have to have physical states just the way humans have them and no other way. That again seems to be a little bit of a hard sell. So some problems with reductive physicalism that makes it less than appealing. There's also something called non-reductive physicalism, which sounds better but is really not a whole lot different at the end of the day, because non-reductive physicalism basically says, well, we don't really want to reduce biological, sociological, psychological concepts to physical ones, but this is really just a matter of convenience. This is really just a matter of the fact that we have interests and um, ways of expressing ourselves that are uh, very much um, aided in, uh, in a kind of practical way by having alternative vocabularies and conceptualities. So although the biological, the sociological, and the psychological as such are ultimately nothing but physical things, we like the fact that we have these kind of additional vocabularies. They're very convenient towards us. They serve our practical interests, and therefore we don't want to reduce them. We don't want to reduce everything to physics. This is not a robust uh, endorsement of things beyond the physical world. So again, not the most satisfying position. 
uh, there's also been functionalism, which is uh, basically thinking of the mind as a kind of computer in the most basic Turing machine sense of that phrase. So uh, we don't tackle the question of what the mind actually does, what its intrinsic features are. Instead, we just look at it as a kind of input-output system. We just look at it in terms of its functionality. We look at mind, what mind does, not what mind is. This was a popular approach for a couple decades. It has a couple serious drawbacks. The first is that it's not very intellectually satisfying because we really do want to know what happens inside that black box. The nature of intellect is actually a very important philosophical question. And that's exactly what functionalism will not touch. Uh, the second thing is, this is called the promiscuity objection. I like that word. Uh, functionalism is promiscuous in the sense that there are a whole bunch of things that we're pretty sure don't have minds that qualify, that qualify as mind under functionalism's definition. So things like thermostats, ATMs, um, anything, any system that would have a kind of input-output character seems to qualify as mind here. So your copier, insofar as you punch in numbers, put in uh, the piece of paper and uh, other pieces of paper come out, that's an input-output kind of system. Your copier has a mind. Uh, this is not what we really mean, and this, doesn't, this seems to be too broad. So functionalism is too broad. Um, the other thing that put the nail in functionalism was a little thought experiment by John Searle, which you might have heard of, called the Chinese room argument. It basically goes something like this. As you have a guy or a girl uh, in a room with a whole bunch of ch workflow charts and graphs and things, they don't know a word of Chinese, not even a little. And yet what they will do is receive inputs in Chinese, and they will turn to their charts and graphs, and look at the suitable equivalents, and type in an English response, and an English response will exit the room to the person on the outside. Now from the outside, the person is going to see the input, get the output, and see absolutely no difference between what's happening in the Chinese room uh, and the, the actual person who might know Chinese. So you remove the technician and all the charts and graphs, and you put someone who actually understands Chinese in that room, it will look largely the same from the person on the outside. The only difference is that it's only in the second case, the person who actually understands Chinese, that we think that we can say, you understand Chinese. Someone who simply receives the input and looks for the correct answer in maybe a, a potential infinity of pages um, is not actually engaged in a process of understanding. Searle's point in this whole thought experiment is to distinguish between what we really think mind is in its most essential characteristics of understanding versus this input-output uh, scenario. And then we have a couple of final theories on what mind does. Epiphenomenalism is a, a theory that basically says no mental things are really uh, distinct from physical, but they're caused by the physical world. Now, epiphenomenalism is interesting because the caveat here is that um, the mental is always epiphenomenal. It is caused, but it has no causal efficacy of its own. So it's like the foam on a wave. It's caused, but it has absolutely no effect on anything else in the world. So the, the mental is generally ca genuinely caused by the physical, but then it just kind of sits there inert. There are a couple problems with epiphenomenalism too. The biggest being that, uh, from our viewpoint, it seems like mental states do make a difference. The way we think and understand the world seems to influence our actions, which in turn inf influences our bodily activities, which then in turn influences our neighbors and the world around us. In other words, we want to say that mental thing and epiphenomenalism basically says that's impossible. Not that great. Emergentism is like epiphenomenalism insofar as it, too, posits mental phenomena as being their own kind of thing. That is, mental events or mental states are genuinely different from physical, and yet they are entirely caused and explained by the physical which gives rise to them. This is uh, appealing because it makes the mental real, 
but it is a little bit mysterious insofar as we can't quite say exactly how the physical is able to give expression to and reality to the mental world. How does that happen? So for instance, there are system-wide higher order features in the world that we can explain by their constituent parts. So for instance, we understand that a choir has a bigger sound than its individual singers alone because you put those voices together and working together they give you that nice big choral sound. In other words, it's the power of numbers coming together that uh, explains the difference between a choir versus an individual voice. And for instance, there are various um, networks of things that we understand how something is able to, that network is able to do more than its individual components because of the networking. Or why crystalline structures work because the individual um, atoms and molecules come together in a, a special kind of structure. Um, that's the kind of explanation that we're looking for that emergent phenom uh, phenomena in the sense of emergentism doesn't quite give us. So all these uh, various approaches to philosophy of mind end up leaving us wanting and this has actually uh, given rise to a new approach to philosophy of mind that's come on the scene in the last couple decades. It's really quite new. And it looks towards the idea of structure as a way of accounting for a lot of what human minds do. So the mental, the biological, the psychological, and sociological um, are all connected to the physical but they are not reducible to physical components. They are made possible by a, a special kind of structure that utilizes physical parts. This is called contemporary hylomorphism, and there are actually a number of uh, very good philosophers of mind that are working in hylomorphic theory. Um, in many ways it is, and it hopefully has already struck you as such, as a kind of retrieval of the Aristotelian Thomistic concept of matter and form which isn't to say that contemporary hylomorphism and uh, Thomistic hylomorphism are the same thing. But there is this in common, that we are able to account for something's unique properties, both static and dynamic, that is not only what it is, but what it does, by appealing to its structure, or in traditional parlance, its form. This is an answer to the emergentist problem of how we're able to talk about how higher level properties are related to lower level properties. It is by virtue not only of the kinds of parts a thing has, but how those parts are themselves utilized, integrated, and formed into greater wholes that we begin to really understand biological, psychological, and social systems. And the form or configuration of parts cannot be causally reduced or otherwise explained by appealing to the parts themselves, at least not alone. The structure of a neuron, for instance, will not ultimately explain how and why it is that neurons are networked in a certain complex way, though to be sure the nature of the neuron will limit the possibilities for such uh, networking. Likewise, the cells of the body cannot of themselves explain how they come to exist in various organs and systems, uh, themselves integrated into a living and composite whole plant or animal. So hylomorphism acknowledges that parts and wholes must necessarily work together. Uh, wholes are limited by the capacities and potentialities of their parts, but are not reducible to or ultimately explained by those parts. It is on the level of the whole that we must uh, explain how those capacities and potentialities are put to use. And you see this in contemporary neuroscience all the time. So for instance, um, although seeing red tends to activate only kind of one part of our brain, using language actually um, activates something close to 25 different parts of our brain simultaneously. And most of their par those parts are actually possessed by um, other animals. They just aren't used together in the same way. Now this is one of those things that has only become to be originally, um, uh, has only become uh, recently uh, really truly appreciated because uh, we were for many, many years um, really keyed into the difference in brain size. So there are a lot of biologists who said the difference between being a human being and being an animal is actually we have a much bigger brain. 
And neuroscience is actually coming to the opposite conclusion, that even our, though our brain is bigger, our brains actually share an awful lot in common with things like chimpanzees. It's the way that our brain uses its structures, integrates different parts, that becomes the difference. And this is the kind of difference that hylomorphism will really latch on to and say, same parts, different way in which they come together and form a whole. And so there's an, there's an absolutely uh, vital top-down explanation at work that we can't neglect. So this is one, one way of my saying that uh, St. Thomas um, has actually been a bit of an inspiration to contemporary philosophy of mind in trying to find a more satisfying solution to how it is that the mental and the physical are related. Because again, we don't really want to fall into substance dualism where we say one has nothing to do with the other, but the alternative of trying to reduce one to the other also seems really uh, unpromising. But if we realize that what we're actually talking about is matter and form, structure and stuff working together, we can come to appreciate that there is a way in which uh, mental and physical uh, are related without being reducible to one another. As I mentioned, one of the things that Aquinas is going to insist on is that human uh, souls are quite a bit different from other kinds of souls. One of those, uh, and his uh, evidence for that is going to be uh, centered around the very nature of our intellectual activity. We begin with a principle that I like to refer to uh, by the Latin, because it makes you sound really smart, um, called agere sequitur esse. Agere sequitur esse literally translated is being, uh, sorry, action follows being. <clears throat> This is just a fancy way of saying that you are what you do, you do what you are. Why don't we go swimming with polar bears or keep tigers as pets? Because those animals are not pets, and there are some people who find this out the hard way. <laughs> but it's really a fundamental metaphysical principle. What something does or can do is indicative of the kind of being it is. In a more modern metaphysics, this is referred to as the principle of sufficient reason. What you do can only be accounted for by what you are. Now, for St. Thomas, we can actually talk about the immortality of the soul because we as human beings already have an immaterial faculty. We already do something that is radically not material and that is not connected to any kind of physical part of us, any kind of physical organ, and that is the actual process of intellectual and re intellect and reasoning. And this is where the important difference between sensation and understanding uh, comes in. If we were to simply say understanding is simply a uh, variation on sensibility, it's just a kind of sensation raised to a different level, um, we wouldn't be able to make this argument. But if we appreciate that there are two fundamentally different kinds of operations, therefore two fundamentally different kinds of faculties, we have to understand that our soul is not only material, it informs this body, but it also has an immaterial aspect that transcends the, the particular uh, bodily material existence it currently has. And this is the foundation for <clears throat> Aquinas' argument that the soul is immortal. If our souls have an operation which is completely immaterial in itself, which is uh, his understanding of our reason, then the human soul is also immaterial and able to survive the death of the body. And thus, uh, St. Thomas says, we can know the mode of existence of the human soul from examining its activity. Inasmuch as it has an activity transcending that of material things, it has a higher existence than the body, and it doesn't depend on it. And uh, that's, not, that's the chief argument for the immortality of the soul. Aquinas will also um, uh, indicate that the very fact that we have a natural de desire to always exist, and he believes that natural desires cannot be in vain, is also good evidence for um, our intellectual substance being incorruptible. Or to put it in the words of Helen Keller, I believe in the immortality of the soul because I have within me immortal longings. Now that being said, Aquinas is very clear that we are not souls. 
we are soul body composites. So while the human soul can subsist, yes, you think you turn into an angel when you die, St. Thomas is very disappointed in you. Um, while the human soul subsists, it does not possess a complete existence without the body. And we actually see this in particular in the very activity of understanding. Although understanding is distinct from sensation as an immaterial operation, it actually requires the data of sensation as we've already talked about in order to do its job. So even that characteristically immaterial, immaterial activity of understanding actually requires bodily participation. There are all sorts of things that I'm gonna talk about next time as a result of <laughs> necessity. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was our emotional life and then to talk a little bit about um, how St. Thomas uh, comes into contemporary cognitive science. So we have, of course, a number of emotions that uh, we experience. And for Aquinas, emotions do have a physical component. That is, we never experience an emotion without there being some kind of bodily change in us. Right? So if we, uh, if we get angry or excited, our heart rate's going to go up. Uh, sometimes we get flushed. Um, there's going to be a kind of physical uh, manifestation in us, and that's part and parcel of our having emotions. If we didn't have that, that, that physical uh, reaction, then our emotions wouldn't be very emotional at all. But emotions aren't just sensations. They are not strictly connected to what is in, in, in front of us, so again, they don't share that with sensation. So um, if anyone's thought back to a very unpleasant experience, that can get your heart racing again, your memory of it, right? Where you had an angry encounter and you say, oh man, I should have said this, not that. Uh, that can get you all upset. You don't have to have something in front of you to stimulate that emotion, right? You can, you can conjure that up just by thinking about life. Um, and um, so emotions are not simply reactions to our environment. They're not simply the way the world uh, impinges on us. And we can see that in the, st the uh, structure of emotions in general is that they always have a kind of object. So they're not simply um, something um, like a, a knee-jerk reaction. Our emotions respond to um, sensible goods in the world and, um, and sensible evils. And when we encounter sensible goods, we typically experience what St. Thomas and Aristotle call concupiscible emotions, which is basically emotions of desire. They come in pairs, there are six of them, and they include love and hate, desire and aversion, joy and sorrow. So it depends on whether we're confronted with a good or an evil. If we're confronted with a good, we tend to go after it, and then we have a particular kind of emotion when we achieve it. And the opposite is true in the case of evil. We also have what are called irascible emotions. These are aggressive emotions that allow us to overcome difficult situations in order to achieve the good. They, are, are, they occur when we face overcoming certain obstacles in order to get good things. And they too um, are um, really typically found in pairs, uh, contraries, hope, despair, confidence, fear, and anger. Anger is the one that doesn't have a contrary. Uh, the irascible emotions are for the sake of the concupiscible emotions. So it's, it, um, we have things like uh, anger and hope uh, and fear and such in order to allow us to deal with difficulties in life so that ultimately we can get what we want and dwell and enjoy good things and avoid evil things. So the concupiscible and irascible emotions really work together. Now one of the things I want to emphasize here is that um, emotions in St. Thomas are not uh, irrational in the literal sense of that word. Emotions are linked to bodily changes, but they're also linked to the ways in which we perceive the world around us. And so we might say there's an intrinsic intelligence to emotions. Um, they are subject to our reason, that is true, but they also uh, transmit information about what's going on in us. They give us some basic facts about how things stand with us, what's going well, what's going good, what's threatening us, what, what we're hoping for, what we're um, 
what we're anticipating, enjoying, and so on. And doing it in a way where this actually precedes most of our um, reflective thinking. This happens in a kind of ordinary encounter with things that precedes our being able to sit down and really analyze our emotions and uh, give concepts and words to things that we've experienced. Uh, this is a depiction of emotions by the French artist Charles de Le Brun uh, from 1668. These were illustrations that came along with most later editions of Descartes' uh, Passions of the Soul, which he wrote in 1649. Now, unlike uh, Descartes and the Enlightenment, which tended to look at the emotions as um, basically the opposite of reason, they tended to downplay our emotional life or depict it as uh, essentially irrational and productive and even dangerous. Um, in contrast, Aquinas has a lot more in common with 20th century philosophers like French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre, who we'll hear more about uh, next time, um, or the decisive German philosophical figure of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger. Uh, both of these existentialist uh, phenomenological thinkers um, really emphasized the importance, the significance of a number of our key emotions. Heidegger um, liked to um, dwell on the darker, broodier kinds of emotions. So like any good German, he liked to talk about guilt and anxiety and things like that. So did Sartre. Um, but uh, in a more general way, uh, Heidegger insists that our emotions are key to understanding how the world matters to us. Emotions say something of how things are going with us, not in exact conceptual terms, but in broad sweeping strokes. So I find myself feeling bad, or perhaps good, uh, bright and hopeful, or upset and anxious, long before I can say exactly what it is that I'm anxiously feeling about, or what is actually going wrong with me. And I can, for instance, feel the emotion of fear, that something is wrong and that I'm in danger, long before I'm able to actually identify what that fear is really about, before I, that uh, danger is clearly present to me. And it is because I am already oriented towards things and they affect me, they matter to me in emotional and practical ways that I am then able to dis deploy my higher perceptual and cognitive abilities to cope with my environment and to understand my circumstances. So my intelligent apprehension of reality finds a key moment in my emotional effective apprehension of things. Uh, what Sartre and Heidegger have articulated in philosophical language, by the way, has been the subject of research in cognitive and neuroscience in recent decades. The emotions, um, so long unappreciated and considered to be irrational or purely physiological responses to our environment, are now seen as key parts of our human intelligence. And if this is in fact the case, which I believe it is, then we have to say that human intelligent, intelligence in general is a lot less like being a robot, an angel, or a detached bodiless observer, like that brain in the vat, uh, and much more like being an embodied mind, a participant and fellow traveler in the world. Uh, we, in other words, we know the world not by merely observing it at a distance, though we can do that in a limited way, but by being immersed and involved in it. Put in more traditional terms, we begin to understand ourselves as rational animals where our rationality is not in conflict with but actually a possibility and fulfillment of our animality. Now, some of these themes that I've been talking about are exactly what cognitive science is doing uh, these days. There has recently been uh, an approach to cognitive science that's become more and more popular called 4E cognitive science, and those, uh, that 4E refers to mind as embodied, embedded, enacted, and extended. So the idea that mental processes are at least partly constituted or made up of wider extraneural bodily structures and processes, that mental processes are um, possible only in tandem with certain environmental features outside the brain and even the body, that mental processes are not just neural processes, but the actions of an organism as a whole, and as a result, the way in which the world contributes or resists to the actions of that organism as a whole. And then mind as extended. Mental processes are not 
located exclusively inside an organism's head, but extend out into the organism's environment. Um, one way we might understand this is simply understanding that perception, our perception of the world, actually involves, at an intrinsic level, our being able to move around it. So although paintings like this one, this painting is um, entitled A Rainy Day by Gustave Kayabot, it's a, a will probably strike you as familiar. It has, uh, uh, uses artistic uh, techniques of perspective, um, converging lines and things like that to give you a particular vantage point and, a, and a, uh, the, the sensation of a particular view of a particular scene on a street. Now this is not actually how our ordinary vision works. We don't have convergent lines and these artistic techniques to give us perspective. But what we do, um, in order to give our sense, uh, uh, ourselves a sense of our position relative to other objects and the fact that we live in a three-dimensional world at all, is we combine our retinal images, which are inherently two-dimensional, with our ability to move around our environment. So we're able to approach an object. And in approaching an object, we see that the object actually gets larger, right? It takes up a greater part of our visual field and we're able to back off, which means that the object gets smaller, and it takes up a, a smaller portion of our visual field. We're able to actually rotate or revolve around the object so I can actually walk around that table and see it from one side and another and another. And I'm able to uh, engage in a lot of these kind of bodily movements that I'm able to do voluntarily, and when I voluntarily move my body, the visual images that are available to me change. So there's a correlation between my bodily activities and the visual images that come my way. And this was something that was analyzed by Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology uh, at the um, turn of the century. But it was actually a question that was raised by uh, this guy in um, the right-hand corner. His name was George Barclay. George Barclay actually had a big question about how three-dimensional vision was possible. Because he said, you know, the images themselves are always two-dimensional. That's all you get in an image, right? It's flat. Um, the three-dimensionality comes from combining those images with actually being able to move around our environment and correlating images with bodily activities. This is something that has actually been explored extensively by um, Alvin Noe, who is actually here in Berkeley at Cal. Um, he's done a number of different experiments using inversion goggles and talking about the way blind people actually use uh, instruments like walking canes and sticks to uh, tactilely see around their environment. And um, using various experiments, he's actually come to the conclusion that perception is not adequately understood if we simply understand perception as taking in passively these two-dimensional images. Perception is actually correlating those images with our sensory motor skills. And one example of this is these inversion goggles here. Um, people put them on, and what ends up happening is that things are immediately shifted around. So there are, uh, there are a number of different varieties. The ones that he talks about most extensively are the ones that shift left and right. So you put them on, left becomes right, right becomes left. And for 20 to 30 minutes, the people wearing the goggles are pretty darn confused. But if they are actually trying to do stuff in their environment, they try to walk around and manipulate objects and things, what happens before they hit the half hour mark is that they become progressively less confused and more able to cope with their environment. And at some point, the images write themselves. Pretty amazing. So they begin to experience the images as being completely coherent again, and they're able to function fairly well. In fact, they sometimes forget that they're wearing the goggles until they take them back off and they're disoriented again. <laughs> um, uh, P.S. The reason that I haven't taken these on is the goggles are a little bit expensive. They also give you a pretty raging headache, or so I'm told. So I'm not eager to, to put them on. But it does inter underscore Alvin Noe's uh, uh, contention that perception involves a lot more than just being a kind of disembodied observer. That we're actually using bodily skills. That perception is an embodied activity, as so many aspects of our knowing and understanding the world are. And therefore, being human 
is an embodied, enacted, extended, and embedded activity. So what do we say about the brain and the vat? Well, as much as we might like the matrix, as much as we like, uh, might like um, Descartes, uh, we should say that the brain and the vat is a compelling picture because in many ways we've forgotten that uh, so much of what we're able to do uh, when we understand and perceive the world is uh, involving every little bit of us. It's not simply a kind of part of my brain that's responsible for everything. And the rest of me is just this kind of a appendage that I kind of lug along. Um, our cognitive, our emotional, and our sensory activity is not merely a firing of a series of neurons or pattern of neurons, and it's not simply the brain doing its work. If we think this, we fail to realize how much goes into the very human activities of sensing, being affected in our emotional life, and actually using all that in order to engage in reasoning and understanding. All these things involve us as entire living organisms. Our social relationships, our immediate and habitual environment, our historical and cultural heritage, all of these things are brought to bear in order for us to have a full human existence. And none of this is possible if all we are are brains and vats getting electronically stimulated in different parts of our brain. A meaningful world is built up and maintained and sustained through a multitude of different complex relationships, causes, and embodied activities. And Aquinas' philosophy is one way, I think, very complementary with much of what's going in cognitive science and in neuroscience um, to find a more satisfying approach to the human being, to identify all these different aspects of us, internal and external senses, emotions, mental and physical capacities, and various relationships with other human beings that allow us to have <clears throat> a fully human existence. Before I close with a, human, uh, with a, a, a closing prayer, uh, let me just say, um, and this is um, my way of trying to, to um, honor our staff <laughs> and our recruitment efforts. Um, the DSPT is the kind of place that is constantly asking these kinds of questions. So if you found anything interesting in this morning's lecture and you want to know more, there are lots of classes you can take that would respond to various interest, interests that you might have. So Professor Vega and I teach a, a class together called Mind and Brain, uh, which examines these things from the perspective of philosophy of mind. Uh, Father Michael Dodds teaches a wonderful philosophical anthropology class uh, where he does a very good job going into the nitty gritty of Aquinas' theory of the human being. Um, I myself teach a class called Approaches to Embodiment where I use cognitive science, um, phenomenology, and Aquinas in tandem to talk about how our embodiment actually contributes to our human existence. So these are some of the things that happen at the DSPT. So if you're interested in um, ever attending a class, enrolling in a class, or supporting somebody who is interested in attending or enrolling, uh, please do see Aaron after, uh, after we conclude with the prayer. So let us pray. I praise, glorify, and bless you, my God, for the immeasurable blessings shown to me who am unworthy of them. I praise your tenderness calling out to me, your kindness welcoming me, and your mercy for giving my sins. I praise your humility that consoles me, your patience that shelters me, your eternity that preserves me, and your truth that rewards me. For all these, I am incapable of sufficient praise. I thank your majesty for the abundance of your immense goodness. May you always increase your grace in me, preserve that increase, and reward what you have preserved. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so I apologize for going over, and therefore I haven't left you nearly as much time for questions. But I, I hope if any of you have them, and I'll, I'll do my best because there's an awful lot that you could ask, and I'll be very honest about what I don't know. Um, 
But uh, please, if you have any questions, um, do raise your hand. Saeed? the emotions, desires, love, hate, desire, uh, joy, sorrow, those aren't even the ones that I, I mean, but the, the ones that we have, how would they correlate or bring about sin or virtue? That is a great question. Um, this is actually uh, a topic that we um, tackle in my philosophical ethics class which happens bright and early at 8 o'clock. So it's, it's entirely fueled by coffee, both, both on my side and on the side of my students. Um, but when we read the Nicomachean Ethics together, we do a sustained reading of that text. We actually talk about Aristotle's understanding of virtue. And his understanding of virtue is those habits, uh, and by habit, he really means a, a kind of, of state of mind. So not, not a, a mindless habit, but a very thoughtful um, thing that, that for us has become second nature. Um, that allows us to do good things, allows us to do them well and do them easily. And as a result of this virtue, uh, the, the reason actually has a kind of control of or link to the emotions that's very productive. So when we're courageous, for instance, that emotion of fear is, is well utilized for our well-being. Uh, the, the not courageous person's fear tends to go uh, out of control or tends to be diminished in a way that's very dangerous. So one of the examples I give is um, in your ordinary horror movie, the person who is going to make it to the end of the horror movie is going to be the person who has the virtue of courage because they're able to use their fear in a way that contributes to their well-being. Right, the person who has too much fear is going to kind of just cower and get ax murdered to death, right? Um, and the person who doesn't have enough fear is gonna say, hey, let's go put on our bathing suits and go in the forest and see if we can find the killer. And that never ends up well either, right? Um, <laughs> so the person who has a very uh, reasonable and moderate level of fear <laughs> that actually corresponds with reality is gonna be the person who makes it to the end of the movie. That's uh, Aristotle's understanding of virtue. Um, now, there's going to be an additional dimension that the theological virtues give to the emotions. But the idea is that how we utilize the emotions is going to be the difference between sin um, and virtue, or vice and virtue, or uh, an overall healthy uh, well-being and a healthy psyche versus a, a, a psyche that is, is, is suffering and tortured. So, and this is something that you, pr you hopefully will hear from your priest in the confessional as well. So if you go to the confession and say, Father, I was just so angry. Father should immediately say, well, what did you do with that emotion? And if you say, well, I got it down on my knees and I prayed for my enemy, Father's next word should be, that is not a sin. Just your feeling and emotion doesn't rise to the level of, of sinfulness at all. So I have to remind a lot of uh, penitents that come in and see me that having feelings is part of being human and not necessarily uh, sinful. What you do with that emotion is uh, where sin comes in. My pleasure. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, from what I understand about Thomistic epistemology, that our knowledge still begins in the senses. And so an embodied soul requires that body to have those experiences. So if, if a brain in a vat were alive as such, the, the soul would still be embodied in, in, in that sense, right? So I, I guess I'm still wondering how a hylomorphosis would have a problem with if, if the physical component, if, if however my senses get to my brain before it becomes <clears throat> intellectual, if that part could be faked, uh, how, how does the brain of the vat problem go away for even a hylomorphist? Uh, that's a great question. So the idea is that a, a soul would naturally inform a complete human body, not just a part of a body, right? So um, it's not that actually a, a soul does, uh, uh, more accurately speaking, the soul does both, right? So when a, a soul informs a human body, it informs the whole and its parts. But the parts are integrated into the whole. So it's, it's very odd to be talking about a human being if we're talking about simply one organ, no matter how well wired and um, uh, 
<laughs> electroded that organ might be. So the objection there would be not that there's no bodily component at all, but that it would be a very partial bodily component and that souls are meant for complete bodies, not for body parts. Hopefully that helps. Uh, thank you, Renix. Thank you. Um, my question is, you know, less philosophical and more on the theological lines of this. Um, based upon what we've been going over today, my question is, uh, would this go a long way in explaining why there's so many anthropomorphisms in the Old Testament and necessitate Christ being incarnate for us to be able to fully understand and engage with God based upon how we're created? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I, I, sh I should say the pro only, only really appropriate response to that is I don't know, because playing guess what's in God's head is a very dangerous game, and I'm really bad at it. But um, I, I, I would say that, that my, my own hypothesis is absolutely yes. Um, in other words, um, has anyone seen the movie Arrival? Um, it's a very interesting movie because it's about these, these big aliens that have very, very different bodies than us and end up having a very, very different language from us. And Amy, what's her last name? Amy Adams. Amy Adams basically plays a, a linguist who uh, is trying to decipher their language. Uh, hopefully I haven't given you too much away from the movie. But um, her, one of her huge challenges, and I actually think the movie downplays the, the challenges that would actually be part of this if it were a real scenario, is trying to understand uh, a being that has virtually nothing in common with you. Um, what she eventually ends up doing is finding something in common with, with these beings. And I, I think that actually uh, becomes the important part of our communication, is we have to find something in common in order to be able to communicate uh, on a substantial level uh, with someone or something else. So, uh, um, even in the Old Testament, we have a God who is able to reach out to us because he's able to speak our language. And uh, that is intensified by the word become incarnate, who not only is able to speak our language um, in the literal sense of language, but is able to speak our language by being us in every way except sin. So I think that's a great way of thinking of the incarnation, is it's, it's God reaching out to us in a definitive way that is uh, um, ultimately and intimately communicative. Thank you. Um, when you talked about um, the uh, internal senses um, that uh, Thomas Aquinas had uh, 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 attention to, um, uh, there was a, a very strong association of ideas. Um, there is a, a um, René Magritte, a wonderful exhibit now in San Francisco, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, that the, the best description of the philosophy of that is the, the contrast between what we see and what we know. Because he said that the senses have to, they have, to have a certain coordination. Uh, if hearing, seeing, and hearing do not uh, connect, or uh, it doesn't bring in <laughs> the correct image, okay? And so um, the Magritte um, exhibit is perfect to describe exactly that situation. And um, it is on, um, this is an advertisement uh, until the 28th of this month. So it, uh, it, it's getting more and more crowded naturally because we are approaching the end. But I warmly recommend it. It is a wonderful exhibit. Thank you very much. Yeah, and of, oftentimes uh, seeing some of these philosophical uh, concepts and ideas come into a more concrete form makes a huge, huge difference. I, I would also say that some of the power of the art is actually to bring us a uh, very slight disorder that makes us re-look at things. So the idea that we, we, we order things, we put, them we, we put them together via our senses. If we get uh, radically new information because an artist has, has changed something that's very important in their piece of work, it's like reality, but with these changes, or this, this is more abstract, or this is misshapen, or, you know, that can actually com completely give us a new look and insight into reality. And um, so that would be another interesting connection with that kind of art. That's really neat. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, thank you. Uh, where does desire fit into this? Is, it seems that it's more than an emotion, and it seems to have as its object something that's um, transcendent. And it, but yet, it's not, so it, it seems like it's more than instinct, but yet there's like a, there, it's calling for something, like this longing that Helen, so is that, what is desire? How would you place it in what you just spoke about today? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, I would have had, uh, I just ran out of time. And uh, thankfully, a lot of these um, uh, questions we'll actually revisit or expand on uh, in the next talk uh, when um, Sartre and Aquinas get together for, for Cafe au lait or um, whatever they might do in a French cafe together. Um, but um, our, we have a lot of different kinds of desires. And our desire for, uh, for St. Thomas and Aristotle both are correlated to the mode of our apprehension. So we have sensible desires and then we have intellectual desires. And the, the deeper, more existential desires actually come uh, through our intellectual activity. Um, so the emotions are a direct result of our having certain desires, which is why the key emotions are concupiscible, they're desirous emotions. So if we didn't desire things, we wouldn't have things like joy and sorrow, um, which Stoic philosophers are very eager to point out to us, by the way. They say, you know, the one way to avoid pain in this world is to desire nothing. And that's absolutely right. You know, if you have no expectations, you have no disappointments. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, that's easier said than done because being a human being means that we have certain uh, ordinary desires. In fact, um, St. Thomas and Aristotle both will say that all you need is that first um, uh, external sense of touch in order to be able to experience pleasure and pain through that one exterior sense. And with that experience of pleasure of pain, you now have desire and emotion insofar as you want the pleasure and you don't want the pain. Now I'm using want because what we're really talking about is very, very simplistic um, organisms, right? But we see even with very simple organisms that um, painful stimuli causes them to retreat and flee and pleasurable stimuli attracts them. <clears throat> and for, um, for Aristotle Aquinas, and I think this is one of the many uh, things that, that makes their philosophical theory so compelling, is that there are um, certainly differences in our desires versus the desire of amoeba, but it's not completely unrelated. There's a continuity from one end of existence to the other. So for them, it, it can start with those very simp that's very simple level of desiring that is simply a result of having that one door of touch to the world outside versus the very complex ways in which we can desire things through the variety of senses that we have and ultimately our intellectual activity. But we'll talk about the more existential, eternal desires uh, next time. Hi. Uh, could you speak a little more on the relationship between the cogitative sense and the agent intellect? Because they seem really similar. Uh, it seems the only distinction is they do very similar functions, but one is a sense and one is a, um, a faculty. Um, yes, you actually are asking a question that is um, currently um, being discussed slash debated in the Thomistic community because the cogitative sense has been a little bit of a, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, a mystery in the past. So there are some Thomists who have said things like, the cogitative sense is really just our ability to apply our, our intellectual activity back to particular things. However, that seems to be part and parcel of our intellect, and so I would not put that in the sensible, I'd put that in the intellectual. So I have not been convinced by that explanation. My explanation is that it is, it is uh, propedeutic to intellectual activity insofar as we are able to make connections between things. So um, in my, my rather uh, goofy and trivial example of uh, Fido the dog and our ability to come up with the concept of dog, notice that we have to uh, um, already kind of gather and notice similarities between individual dogs before we can actually do the process of abstracting the concept of dog proper. And that recognition of similarities across various instances is what I think amounts to the cogitative sense. 
uh, if that makes any sense. So to already rec have some kind of pattern recognition is not to already have a universal concept fully articulated, but it's, it's the uh, precondition. It's the necessary condition for being able to do that. It's, it's recognizing similarities and differences, right? So, so then what that allows my reason to do is kind of to start digging and say, what's behind that similarity? And behind that similarity between Fido and Snickers and Fifi and uh, all the different dogs that we're talking about. <laughs> I'm really bad at making up dog names. Um, <laughs> Rex and Rin Tin Tin. Um, uh, the reason that I, I already am able to see them all as having something in common. Now, I don't know exactly what that something in common is yet. And that's where my, int my intellection actually comes into play and allows me to actually do the process of abstraction. But being able to see that they all have, you know, some kind of, I don't know what in common um, is already something. I mean, for instance, to be able to see that that blue and that blue and you know other kinds of blue, that blue, the blue of the sky, etc., are all seem to have something kind of in common, is uh, another example of that sort of thing. I don't have, I may not have a, a fully articulated concept of blue yet, but I see that these blues are similar, whereas that blue and you know a really dark red outside are very different. So it's, I, the way I cash it out is an, our ability to see and connect similarities and differences with one another. So how about for alignment? Um, would, would they just this or would they only be able to do Their sensory information would be different. But I think that they would have a similar power for seeing, for not seeing, um, hearing or sensing other sorts of differences. So, f for instance, they would, um, I would imagine that a blind person would be able to tell the difference between um, a clink versus um, a ring versus, um, in other words, they're able to kind of parse out how sounds are alike and different, for instance. So, um, so they would be able to do uh, on the, maybe on the audio uh, level what we're able to do on the visual level. I, I use visual examples just because they tend to be the most obvious for us as sighted people. Brother, was there a question here? What are some of the differences between contemporary hylomorphism and Aristotelian hylomorphism? Oh, that's very good. Um, that gets very technical. Um, let me just say that the biggest thing, the biggest difference between contemporary hylomorphism and Thomistic hylomorphism uh, usually revolves around the, this question of there being an immaterial aspect to the human soul. So that's not something that you're going to, most of your, um, your hylomorphists who are talking about philosophy of mind are going to delve into. That's a, a metaphysical argument. So uh, they're going to, uh, the biggest difference is the perspective. They're coming from the contemporary Anglo-analytic tradition. And they do have um, a, a very empirical and scientifically grounded con conception of form. Um, so I would say a lot of it is difference in emphasis. And uh, the more substantial differences, it would, it would tend to be the various hylomorphists that you're you're talking about. Um, so that's, um, those are some of the big, broad strokes. I think we have time for two more questions, which are actually right up here. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around this. Couldn't resist. Uh, uh, the question I have is, uh, if we, uh, when we are disembodied after death, uh, what is the state of our mind, you know, the mind in the proverbial vat, as it were? Um, <clears throat> Aquinas has uh, quite a bit to say, actually, about uh, how we come to exist and specifically how we can know things um, when we are in a disembodied state. Um, this, this gets, I think, uh, a little bit more speculative because he is... Um, essentially doing a thought experiment. What would it be like if the normal channels of how we take information are not available? And uh, so he posits something like uh, an intuition of essences 
um, and that God uh, allows that to happen while we are separated from our body. Um, he, he does not, um, he, he basically says that is an unnatural way for us to be, however. So that's not how we're supposed to take in information. It's an exception to the rule. Um, but he, he, does, he does say that uh, in many ways God has to provide for um, our sensible faculties because without our body, all our sensible faculties are not available to us. And that includes not only the external senses but also the internal senses. This is very interesting. Um, my question has to do with, with your statement early on, earlier on in the, in the talk where you, where you addressed uh, St. Thomas's uh, uh, opinion of vision being it the, the highest sense. Well, it seems like if St. Saint, Saint Thomas were a, a dog, he would have said that the, the highest sense is smell. If he were a bat, it might be hearing. And so I, I'm, I'm just wondering, where did he get that, get that other than the fact that, that as human beings, our vision is our primary sight? I mean, there's, it seems like pretty arbitrary. Um, that's a very interesting point. And I'm not sure I could completely 100% defend that. Um, uh, it is based on Aristotelian biology, so I take that for a grain of salt. Um, Although uh, Aristotle's biology actually does tend to be pretty darn good when he's talking about uh, concrete characteristics of things. So he was, um, you probably have to wait all the way, I might have said this last month, but you probably have to wait all the way until Darwin to find someone who is as attentive to the various physical attributes of various animals. So it's, it's based in large part on Aristotle's observations. And Aristotle's observations are generalizations that could certainly have exceptions. And uh, whether it's biased towards uh, being human, I, I would think that was, would almost be inevitable. <laughs> so, so yes, uh, highest in absolute sense or highest for us. I think we can say, at least for human beings, it's definitely our highest faculty. If, if we, uh, in other words, for people who have all five, um, we, we tend to have a, a real preference for, for the visual over everything else. Now, of course, that again changes very, very much if, if, you're, if you're lacking vision. Um, I, a blind person, I'm sure, could make a similar uh, argument and say, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing just fine, and in fact, I'm able to take in a lot more information about the world than you are because I'm paying attention to other things. So, um, yeah, I think we could take it with a grain of salt. But for both Aristotle and Aquinas, there is a kind of hierarchy in our senses, and it is empirically grounded. Uh, one thing that I, th I think is a little bit more clear is that, that um, touch seems to be the basic. And that, that seems to be a, a pretty solid. The sight being the highest is a, there is a value judgment there that might be hard to um, vindicate in all cases. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Father Justin. Let's give Father Justin a round of applause.